All right there, podcast listeners. Well, welcome back to episode number one of season four of Perfectly Woke. I'm super excited to be joined with my good friend, Jonathan Garlock. What's up? And today on the podcast, we have an amazing, amazing guest, Bruxy Kavi of The Meeting House. Bruxy, how are you doing today? Hey, it's a real privilege to be a part of this. I'm doing well. Thanks, you guys. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, just to start off the podcast, we want to jump right in. Um, Bruxy, you have amazing, amazing work, and maybe you could just talk to the audience out there of how you came to where you are right now, because I want to I want to toot your horn for a minute. Whenever I watch you preach and teach, you just have a style about you that is very easily digestible, very uh, easy to understand. Um, but I know that I know that you didn't get there overnight. So where did you start off in your faith journey and how did you get to where you are right now? Okay. All right. No, thanks, man. Yeah. Easily digestible. That might be true. I'm Brian Zahn for dummies. That's it. I no way. <laughs> just, I listen to Greg Boyd, Brian Zahn and Brad Jerzak and some of the, some, some of the more exploratory thinkers. And then I think, okay, how can I, how can I distill this down into bite-sized chunks? Um, so I'll tell you, I was raised in the Christian church uh, as an evangelical, specifically Pentecostal. And, um, I really have always loved Jesus, but do you know, have you ever had a friend who you really got along with well, but then they started dating somebody who you didn't think was good for them and you didn't get along with very well? <laughs> and I always felt that way about Jesus and the church, you know, his bride. And I would think, you know, Jesus, I love you, but this chick, man, that you're hanging out with, she is a piece of work and I don't think she's good for you. Um, and it just felt like, you know, when you have that friend who's dating that person, you then you have to make a choice. Well, if I want to hang out with my friend, I'm going to hang out with my friend's girlfriend or boyfriend now. And and do I want to do that? And and so I did have this kind of love-hate relationship growing up. I, I, I mean, I love a lot about the church and every expression of the church, Pentecostal church and the more reformed uh, side of the family and the charismatic and the Anabaptist. I think they all have strengths to bring to the table. And there's beautiful things there. But over time, you know, we when you grow up in the church, you become aware of some of the dark spots, the blind spots, the hypocrisy in your own movement. And that's true for every movement. And so I went through that kind of young adult disillusion phase where I said, uh, Jesus has chosen a bride that is not good for him. You know, do I, I need to talk him out of it or something. And then it finally hit me as I matured through it that, uh, well, I'm part of the bride of Christ. That's That includes me. I'm not some third party disinterested observer in a neutral position who can just critique the church without taking ownership and say, this is me, man. And so critique of the church is is actually the shape it takes in my life is repentance to say, how how can I apply this to myself and what can I learn from this? And and so I, I kind of had not only a falling in love with Jesus experience again, but then falling in love with the church again, at least the potential of the church and who the church can be. And um, and so that was um, that was my growing up years. I went to seminary and um, became a Calvinist. I became more Calvinist than Calvin. I, <laughs> I, I don't know about you guys, but I grew up with a lot of questions. Like it's really busy in my brain and yeah. I just had questions. And I think I burned out a lot of youth pastors at my Pentecostal <laughs> church. I'd just always be in their office saying, but what about this passage of scripture? What about this philosophical question? What about this? And and they'd say, you know, Brux, you just, you know, have faith and trust and believe. And I think I kind of overextended them and probably frustrated them. So really, what, by the time I went to seminary, it was just a race from my brain. Who could get there first with answers? Wow. And if you got there first with answers, you would have my loyalty. And uh, I had a reformed systematic theology professor who um, gave me answers. And that's one of the beauties about Calvinistic theology, uh, reformed theology, is it's very meticulous. It's, um, you know, Calvin was a lawyer at first, and he brings that brilliance in his thinking to the table in his theology. And um, and I really appreciated almost the flowchart style of systematic thinking that Calvinist, uh, Calvinist thinking provides. And, and that won my heart. So um, I became a Calvinist, I graduated and became a Baptist pastor after that. Um, and uh, I was I was probably a little too Baptist to be a good Pentecostal by that point and too Pentecostal to be a really good Baptist. And I but, and I was a conservative kind of Baptist, like John MacArthur, John Piper kind of Baptist in, in Canada. We would call that Fellowship Baptist. And um, it's the conservative side of the stream. And, and I loved being there and I learned a lot and I appreciate the emphasis on scripture and systematic theology and thinking precisely. But after a few years of that, things again began to dismantle in my brain. And I began to say, this is beautiful. I've learned a lot being Pentecostal. I've learned a lot being Baptist. I love the church. I love, I, want, I believe in blooming where you're planted, but I'm starting to have more questions again. And 
one of one of these. And sorry, this is a long answer to a simple question. You're, how I right, got here? Right. I love uh, it. What one of the ways that my that I started to get a chink in my armor was I was meeting with Jehovah's Witnesses for a weekly Bible study. Uh, they knocked on my door and I never let them leave. Basically, you know, <laughs> I invited them in and then they would come back week after week and we would have Bible study and it was beautiful. I thought I was converting them. They thought they were converting me. Everybody was happy. <laughs> so we would hang out together really for two or three hours almost every Wednesday afternoon and just go at it. And I I think I usually fared quite well in these debates. And and I could tell when um, when I was making a point because they had this ace up their sleeve that would shut down the conversation. They would say, well, Bruxy, even if what you're saying is true, you can't be representing the true church because the church you represent believes it's okay for Christians to kill one another for the sake of their earthly kingdom. Wow. You know, so if if two countries go to war and there are Christians in both countries and they're part of the army, they will actually kill each other, kill members of the same kingdom of Christ, the kingdom of heaven for the cause of the earthly kingdom. And your your movement, your church thinks that's OK. How can that be the true church? How is that anywhere close to following Jesus? And I would always stop there and go away and say, rats, I think they got Jesus wrong, Archangel Michael, what's with that? They got the Holy Spirit wrong, they got the Trinity wrong, they got so much wrong. And uh, But they got something there that is stopping me in my tracks. And so I really started to stare into the teaching of Jesus more mm. and say, do I have blind spots? You know, I always think my Jehovah's Witness friends have such significant blind spots. And I meet with Mormons and I say, oh, they have such blind spots, but who am I to think I had none? So I... I, I just started to kind of reprocess everything I believe, not this time through the Pentecostal lens or the Reformed lens, or charismatic or any, just the Jesus lens is all I knew. And, and, and that kind of led me to say, okay, I love being Baptist. I've loved being Pentecostal, but there is a, a purer Jesus-y version of all yes. of the above that I want to be a part of. And uh, it doesn't mean you stop being Pentecostal or Baptist or Lutheran or Anglican or whatever you are. It just... It's finding the Jesus-y, the more, the, I'm, I know I'm making up that word, but. I like it, I like it. Okay, the, the more Jesus-y, Christ-centered expression of that is what I really wanted. And um, and that lead, led me back to questioning some fundamentals of just evangelical theology in general and putting Jesus at the center. And for a while I thought, I'm all by myself in this. There's nobody else who's asking these questions. I'm, I'm doing this by, on my own. And uh, wasn't there weren't a lot of podcasts back then I could listen to, and I, the, the internet wasn't around to help me, and so I felt alone, and I thought, in fact, the only people who seem to agree with me, at least on some of the peace teachings of Jesus, I consider to be a cult, so <laughs> well, this doesn't bode well for me discovering the truth. What's happening to me? Yes. Um, and later on then, I discovered, or they discovered me, I got a phone call from an Anabaptist denomination, which is... Um, if you, for people who aren't familiar with Anabaptism, there's the, the, the Protestant Reformation in the early 1500s, and right on the heels of the Protestant Reformation is what's called the Radical Reformation. And the Radicals were actually like the 20-something students of the Protestants who, who said, hey, thank you for uh, dislodging church tradition from the center of our faith and putting the Bible in the center of our faith, sola scriptura. But now when we read the Bible, we realize Jesus should be in the center of our faith. Yeah. And, and, and they challenged their own Protestant professors to say, you're not going far enough with the Reformation. You're not reforming enough. You're putting the Bible in the center, but you got to put Jesus in the center of the Bible that's in the center or else you're using it wrong. Mm -hmm. And Jesus calls us to, uh, to love both our neighbor and also to love even our enemy. And um, at that point, you had Protestants, they were persecuted by the Catholics, but then when they'd set up their own state, then they would persecute the Catholics. And they would uh, go to war, Protestants against Catholics, in the name of the love of Jesus. And Anabaptists just called BS on all of this and said, no, this n none of us are following Jesus if we're going to be killing each other that way. And I, I realized I wasn't reinventing the wheel when I was discovering this stuff. I was, I was actually tapping into a movement that started 500 years ago on the heels of the Protestant Reformation, this thing called the Radical Reformation. And I... I said, these are the people of my tribe. I finally, you know, I've, I, I finally found a, a theological home, even though I, I love the diversity of the body of Christ. And so um, I was asked if I'd co consider coming and pastoring an Anabaptist church called the Meeting House. Um, and we're, that's where I am still today. And even though I was hired as their pastor, I felt like I learned the most in the process. I had this, where have you been on my life experience? <laughs> yeah. And um and so I feel like I'm theologically home now. But I think now there's so much more connectivity online with social media and with podcasts that 
people are finding a theological home even if they are not leaving one denomination to go to another denomination. I'm resonating with Pentecostal brothers and sisters and Baptists and others <clears throat> who are saying, I'm, I'm right there, I'm in the same place. I'm, I'm loving and staying in my own denomination, but theologically I've migrated to a more Jesus-centered approach. And so I feel like um, the lines of division are blurring in the name of Jesus, and that's a beautiful thing. Yeah, you know, Paul, Paul uh, the apostle, clung on to this, uh, in his writings when he says that Jesus has to be preeminent. And what would you blame, and, and there's other things we want to get into, but what would you blame for the church's diversion from Jesus? We call ourselves Christians, uh, but for those, you know, couple thousand years, uh, what what caused the church to get away from a Jesus-centered uh, belief system? Mm, yeah. Uh, you know, it's almost, you know, they say necessity is the mother of invention. And I think the necessity of the Roman Empire when it converted to Christianity uh, after the Constantinian shift, the necessity was that they had to maintain a standing army, lest the pagans invade and Rome be dismantled. Once you have a state religion, when mm -hmm. it's it's now officially Christian to be Roman and officially Roman to be Christian, I mean, you when yeah. you once you have made that shift, you have created a problem because Jesus teaches love of enemy, lay, it's, it's right to lay your life down for your enemy rather than take the life of your enemy. How do you maintain the political state if you've called the political state itself Christian? Yeah. Uh, that Now you have a, a conundrum. And so I think the, theologians had to, by necessity, rethink the centrality of Jesus, at least that aspect of his teachings. And that's one of the real clear things. You know, there's lots of stuff Jesus says. I go, what? What? You, what? But I don't really, I, and I got to process it, got to figure it out, got to put it in this historical Jewish context. And then I think, okay, I think I know what you're getting at here. But a lot of it I scratch my head at. But the peace teaching of Jesus is not one of those things. It's really clear. I mean, you might say what, as in shock and surprise, but you don't, you don't say what is in, I can't understand this. It's yeah. really clear. And um, and so I think that necessity being the mother of invention, the church had to go to work to find a way to dislodge some of the central teaching of Jesus from the center of our faith. Mm -hmm. And and they and they found other places to go in the Bible, so it still seemed very Christian. We can go into the Old Testament to justify violence, very much so. Um, and so they began to, I think, put the Bible and just Christian theology in general at the center of their faith, rather than Jesus at the center of the whole enterprise. So here south of the border, that sounds very familiar right now. Um, mm -hmm. Somebody quoted you in a tweet a couple weeks ago, and, and if this quote is incorrect, straighten me out, but you retweeted it, so I think it's right. You said, religion killed Jesus, or I might add, religion partnered with politics. I feel like uh, religion... In, in our country still partners with politics and we do great harm to Jesus, maybe borrowing from Paul again and saying we crucify Christ afresh. Mm. Uh, can, can you see that to be true? For the yeah, church? yeah, I can. I can. I don't want to pick on the USA, but as do your it. little brother sitting on your shoulders up north, um, you know, sometimes we notice things and we can step back and we can, we can see. Uh, but I mean, God bless you. There's so many, there's a great movement of Christians within the States who are, also trying to point this out and say, look, guys, let's hold up a mirror to ourselves. And But many Christians in the States don't seem to realize the whole world is watching and they, uh, they're they not confused. They're just, this is, it, it feels like Christians are, they're seeing clearly what it seems as though Christians, many Christians within the States just are are willfully trying to ignore or not see. Um, and, and I'm not even, I'm not trying to poo-poo just on Donald Trump. I don't think Trump is the issue as much as the church is the issue. Agreed. Who, who are supporting and who are blindly politicizing their own faith. Um, that I think that's there'll there'll always be leaders we disagree with, but I'm 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 more disheartened by my own family. And if you're a Christian, then you're my family. So I'm not just like a Canadian criticizing Americans. I'm right. a I'm a brother having an in-house discussion with family members. That's our primary identity. And I want to say, guys, do not confuse the kingdoms. There's no such thing as a Christian nation. There's there's only Christians. Christians are people. The, the only nation that we really have citizenry with is the Jesus nation, yes. the kingdom of heaven on earth. And, and that means that our role in the country we're in is to be ambassadors on behalf of that nation rather than to live as though we're citizens of the earthly kingdom. So if you are an American, I mean, in the earthly sense, you're an American citizen, but but the true sense, your primary identity should be, 
uh, I, I am living in America as a commissioned ambassador to America from another country. Yes. And, and, I, and if I'm going to be a good ambassador, I need to know the policies of the country I come from, the king of my country. I need to know because I represent him to this country. And, um, and so I, I would wish that more ca uh, Canadian, American, and Christians around the world would catch that New Testament ideal of being an ambassador to the country that we're planted in. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I appreciate those words very much. Well, you wrote a book a few years ago called Reunion, uh, and that's available anywhere you find your books and uh, pick that up if you don't have a copy. But in that, my take on it is that, that you uh, kind of reframe the gospel. And mm -hmm. I don't want to say it's a new way to see the gospel. I would rather say it's an ancient way to see the gospel. Right. Uh, and so can you talk uh, to us firstly, uh, what is the gospel? Can you describe the gospel for us? Yeah, sure. Happy to. And I will just say, I do think it is important for Christians uh, to continually refresh themselves and bathe themselves in this, in this purest truth that we have, this thing called the gospel. Um, I know there's a lot of Christians who are deconstructing. There's a lot of Christians who are frustrated with the church. And, and while we play that prophetic role of pointing out the problems in the church, uh, I think we, we, we need to make sure we do come back to the centrality of Jesus and the gospel message, or else we'll just become the naysayers and the ones who love to tear down and deconstruct, and we won't be building anything up. And, and I think there's a movement of like ex-evangelical and, and just disheart, dis, dis, disheartened, disencur discouraged um, Christians, evangelical Christians especially, who are saying, I, I've got to tear down my confused faith. And that's a good thing to deconstruct, but but only, uh, you can't do that the rest of your life and then just live in the rubble. There's something beautiful to be built here, this beautiful kingdom. And so um, I wrote Reunion just to give us all a chance in partnership with our non-Christian friends who want to consider Jesus for the first time in their lives and say, actually, I need to reconsider Jesus. So rather than I'm going to come to you with the truth, you who dwell in darkness, to come along with our non-Christian friends and say, this world needs a little more Jesus and I'm part of it. I, uh, You need him, but I need him too. And I need to rethink things and let's learn this together. Um, so with that being said, there there has been a tendency to preach the gospel as though it is a transactional offer to get us into heaven when we die. Yes. Um, and much of that has been influenced in our lives by something called the Four Spiritual Laws by Bill Bright, written in the 1950s, and, and beautiful. Be, I, I appreciate it because it's truth. It's just not the complete truth. It was our fault for distilling something called the Four Spiritual Laws down to to the complete gospel. And, and and those four laws are, number one, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Number two, sin has separated us from God. Number three, uh, Jesus is God's only provision for our salvation. And then number four, we have to receive that gift by faith. So God loves you. Uh, sin has separated you. Jesus is the answer and, and receive it by faith, which is a one beautiful aspect of the gospel. Um, but after the four spiritual laws, campus, uh, Campus, or the Navigators, I think, came up with the Bridge to Life, and then the Billy Graham Association came up with Steps to Peace with God, yeah. and all of these are four points, and it's the same four points with different words. Um, and then in my circles growing up, we had something called the Roman Road, which was, again, four points from the Book of Romans. More recently, our Reformed brothers and sisters have created the Reformed Roman Road, which instead of four verses from the Book of Romans, it's the first four chapters of the Book of Romans. And they say how those first four chapters cover the primacy of God, the sinfulness of us, the centrality of Jesus, and then finally our response of faith. That's chapters one, two, three, four. Again, the same four points. Um, and in, in, um, in the UK, there's something just called the four, which is... <laughs> The four four points uh, again. It's the same four points. So we're I don't know evangelicals. We love our four points, and so I thought this is all beautiful, but this is only one dimension of a much bigger message as we look through the gospel. So in the book reunion, I've divided the gospel into three different ways of talking about the same message: the gospel in one word, the gospel in three words, and the gospel in thirty words. One word, three words, and thirty words. And um, depending on how much time you have to discuss with someone, this gives you uh, just and this this is not meant to be something that we memorize and then just parrot. It. It's meant to be an internal rubric or framework for our minds for us to sort our thinking out about the gospel. And then we 
we communicate it however is appropriate given the conversation that we're in, which we see in the New Testament. There's no one soundbite that just gets repeated over and over again. It, the gospel is so multidimensional, you can enter the conversation about the gospel from different directions, depending on where someone's coming from. Yeah. So that was a lot of prolegomenon. That was a lot of buildup for just what the answer, what's the gospel? So in one word, I would say, although the runners up would be the word kingdom and the word grace, I think in one word, the gospel is Jesus. Mm. It, it, I tell people at our church at the meeting house, if you're having a conversation about really good things, it may be a good conversation, but until you're talking about Jesus, it's not a gospel conversation. You can even be talking about God in general and God's love, and you're having a godly conversation, but until you're talking about Jesus, you're not having a gospel conversation. Jesus is the indispensable centerpiece of the gospel. That's why we have these four Greco-Roman biographies in the Bible called the Four Gospels. They're called the Four Gospels by the early church because of one line in one of them. It's Mark's Gospel, the first verse. Mark begins by saying, this is the beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ. That's how he begins. And then he goes on not to quote a snappy soundbite or some, some phrase that would get repeated. He says, this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus. And then he goes on to tell the whole story, life, death, resurrection, and teachings of Jesus. So the whole message of Jesus, Mark says, is the gospel. And that's why the early church said, well, let's call all four of them then the four gospels. It's because they put they're the story of Jesus and Jesus is the gospel. Right. So I think that should always reframe us and put Jesus at the center. Um, so the gospel in one word. The gospel in three words, then I think the early church picked up on as their first almost catechismic uh, uh, theology statement. Their first, their first uh, statement of faith is these three beautiful words the Apostle Paul says in um, Romans 10, 9. He says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, awesome. and believe that God raised him from the dead, you're saved. Yeah. Jesus is Lord, right? Real declaration that he is, he is king of the universe. He is the center of my life. And, uh, and I believe it's Jesus is Lord, not Jesus was Lord, but Jesus is. He's risen. He's alive. Yes. So, so that, that he, and he says this is the way we're saved is by declaring and believing. Jesus is alive and risen. Jesus is Lord. We tell people at the meeting house, uh, the closest thing we have to an altar call would be, we, we say, um, listen, don't, don't pray a prayer to receive a free gift of grace so you can go to heaven when you die. But we say, um, commit your life to Jesus as Lord. And let us know when you're ready to. And until until then, you're ready to commit to following Jesus as Lord of your life. Then go away and think about it. Um, that's what Jesus would tend to do. And um, and so we say, go, but when you're ready to commit to Jesus as Lord, let us know. Because um, the good news is, the Apostle Paul says, is, I mean, the problem is, if you accept Jesus only as your Savior, you might spend the rest of your life working out whether you want to follow him as Lord. You know, I, I just I, I just wanted that free gift to go to heaven. It's optional. Yes. And, and yet Paul says, well, no, you start with Jesus as Lord, and the good news is you get him as Savior as part of the package. So <laughs> I like that. Right? He says, you, you start by saying, Jesus, you're my Lord, and you will be saved, is how mm -hmm. he completes that thought in Romans 10, 9 and 10. So the, I think the, the gospel in three words is that Jesus is Lord. And, and then we can un unpack that to say Jesus is Lord, to say you're the one who I want to follow. It, it says that you're the one... Who, the one who shows me what God is like, because Lord is also, you know, a stand-in word for God. To say Jesus is Lord is to say, wow, the good news of the universe is that when I look at Jesus, I see what God is like. Yes. And he is gracious and compassionate. And he he not only inverts the circle from the top down, but he inverts. He, he sorry, here, he inverts, he turns it upside down, but he everts. He takes the outside and he puts it in the center. He takes those on the marginalized and he brings them in. And uh, and say, that's what God does. I mean, God, God gets down on his hands and feet and washes, mm -hmm. you know, his hands and knees and washes his disciples' yeah. feet. All right. So Jesus is Lord is really good news. It's really gospel. It's a real declaration about the character of God. So your disenchantment with the church mm. and a lot of people's deconstruction uh, or renovation or, or whatever you want to call it in faith, is it, do you think a, a lot of it has to do with the church calling Jesus Savior, but not really living as he is Lord? Mm. Yeah, I think I think you put your finger on it. You know, Jesus, he would have people come to him ready to follow him, but actually not ready because they didn't realize the high cost of following him, right? right. So they'd come and they'd say, I'm going to follow you, Jesus. And he would turn around and his only word to them is, 
you realize that foxes have holes and birds have nests, but the son of man has nowhere to put his head tonight? Like, you say you want to follow me, but I don't even know where I'm sleeping tonight. Are you sure you want to follow me? Which is so interesting. This person said, I want to follow you. And Jesus says, I, I first need to help you count the cost, which is something he goes into a lot of detail in, in Luke chapter 14, I think, about how important it is to count the cost before you make the decision. Whereas evangelical Christianity shifted and organized a conversion experience that is devoid of counting the cost, but is often a very emotional crisis moment of saying, as the organ play, prays and as we sing another round, why don't you just, you know, with every head bowed and every eye closed, why don't you just lift a hand? No one's going to see you. And it's it's like <laughs> as costless as possible. Right? Yeah. Right. It, it is. There's we're going to make it really, really easy. And some of these people have genuine conversion experience. Absolutely. Because God can work through a multiplicity of ways, even I think when we mess things up. But um, but many people. Uh, our churches don't grow according to the numbers of the people who come forward in altar calls. Many of them wake up the next morning and say, what did I do last night or <laughs> yesterday? Like, I don't know, I felt really tingly. Spiritual and, hangover. Yes. And I grew up with lots of friends I brought to church and Christian concerts and Christian events who they went forward. And uh, and then the next day they were like, actually, I have no idea what went on last night. Yet, <laughs> but uh, I just felt like, you know, that was something I was supposed to do. And now I'm a little embarrassed and... And um, don't ever invite me back to one of those things again. So that's the opposite of how Jesus told us to present the gospel, to say it's really beautiful. And yes, the Apostle Paul says it's a free gift of grace. He says that in Romans, writing to Christians who have already received the grace to say, don't get full of yourselves. You didn't accomplish this. Yeah. But to people who are not yet followers, Jesus, would, if you put Jesus and Paul together, what you might be saying is, yes, it's a free gift of grace that will cost you everything. And you, and you got to be willing to pick up your cross and lay down your life. But, well, Jesus, I think, brings it all together in this one parable. He tells the parable of the treasure in the field, where he says it's like there's a treasure in the field that you could never afford. It will change your life. It's beautiful. But, you, but the guy who wants that treasure realizes I could never afford the treasure. But if I buy the field, I will get the treasure for free because he discovers the treasure in someone else's field. He says, well, I'm going to sell everything I have, give up everything so I can have enough money to buy the field, and then I get the treasure for free. So Jesus combines this idea of great cost and great sacrifice, give up everything, and yet still tells us, but you could never afford the treasure. Don't, don't get cocky and think you're buying your way to salvation. <laughs> you're going to give up everything you got just to get the opportunity to receive a gift this free treasure you could never afford. And it says, when the guy realized the deal he was getting, he sold everything he had with great joy. Yeah. And the story yeah. Jesus tells, right? Absolute joy. That's so beautiful. So it's, it stands against, I can't I can't get this story out of my mind, when the rich young ruler comes to Jesus. And he's he's done all the religious stuff. He's obeyed the commandments his whole life. Yeah. But but he, he reframes, you know, Jesus always promises eternal life. Mm. And we believe... Uh, I believe that that begins in the here and now. Mm -hmm. But but the rich young ruler says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? His question is almost, how do I get to heaven when I die? Right. Yeah. And and so you're, what you're saying about the gospel, uh, or rethinking it, is, is a, a reframing it in my mind of that story. And Jesus is not interested in telling him how to inherit eternal life. <laughs> He's interested in telling him how to have life right now. That's it. That's good. Right. Jesus says in John 10, I have come... Uh, to give you life and life abundantly. And, and the beautiful thing about abundant life, abundant life or or life to the full, I think the NIV says, uh, just a full, a, a life that's on steroids is maximized, maximized life, um, is that it's not always in, right, out, right, up, right, down, right, happy all the time. <laughs> um, I, I, if you can picture, I know for those who are just listening, if you can picture uh, what just plain life looks like, let's set a baseline of like a heart monitor that's not beeping. It's just a beep, just a straight line. If that's just, you know, minimal law life, uh, maximum life is not where the heart monitor suddenly goes way up top and stays there. Mm -hmm. It's like, wow, life abundant is way up here all the time. It's actually a maximum life is life that goes way up and way down, way up and way. You get higher highs. You also get lower lows because you learn to mourn with those who mourn. You get to tap into the sorrow of the world around you and not live 
as just um, an insulated person who separates yourself from the pain of the world because God doesn't separate himself from it. So you you follow the Jesus who heads into this world of pain and gets closer to people who are hurting. So you hurt more when you follow Jesus, but you love more and you find more joy as well. I think the abundant life is is bigger in both dimensions and it's it's more beautiful. Um, and, and Jesus says that starts now. Absolutely. That's good. I love it so much. Bruxy, could you talk to us a little bit about... Um, this concept of self-actualization. Uh, mm. I've heard you talk about that in some teachings. Um, that's yeah. a concept, you know, with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, and I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but also the Buddhist tradition, uh, Buddhist religion, you know, they kind of talk about that a little bit as well. Um, how do we understand this concept of self-actualization? First off, what is that? Second off, how do we understand that under the new covenant? Hey, beautiful. Yeah, thanks for raising that. So you're right. There's this guy called Abraham Maslow. And um, he, in the 1960s, talks about self-actualization as the greatest human need, which is the human need to fully become ourselves. That some people will actually live their whole life and never discover who they were really meant to be and become fully themselves. He calls that self-actualization, to become actually you. Um, and, uh, and I'll just mention that what is fascinating is that just before he died, he said, Actually, self-actualization is the penultimate human need. That is the secondary human need. There's one even greater need. And he shifted his teaching to say, after self-actualization, uh, the next thing you need to, the ultimate thing you need to achieve is self-transcendence. So you, you need to get outside of yourself and realize it's not all about you. It's about something bigger than you. So he said, the first thing you're going to need to do ultimately is figure out who you are, who you're made to be, and become yourself yourself. But he realized some people become self-actualized and and they still and they become narcissistic. They just camp there. They finally realize I was made, you know, like Eric Little in um, Chariots of Fire. You know, I was born to run. When I run, I feel his his pleasure. Beautiful because he was not only self-actualized, he was self-transcendent. He became he knew he was supposed to be, but he also knew that he was plugged into something bigger than himself. But some people just say, you know, I was made to be a concert violinist. I've become a concert violinist. I'm fully self-actualized and I'm the best there is. Now everybody stay away from me and let me let me, you know, fulfill my destiny. Yeah. And we see a lot of people whether it's through online posts or whatever just it's so self-absorbed. So I'm discovering who I am and I love me, which is so good, so good, but they'd stop there. Their gears grind to a halt at that level of self-development, of cherishing who they are and not going from self-actualization onto self-transcendence to say, now, knowing who I am, what bigger thing am I a part of that I can pour myself into? The, the entire human experience and our connection with God. So I think the gospel helps us move toward both self-actualization and self-transcendence. Yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll mention just briefly, uh, as far as self-actualization is concerned, I think that's what the new covenant does. See, under the old covenant, we could never fully live out our calling to be the image bearers of God. To be made in the image of God is to be a choice maker like God, to love like God. And and God is a, a free will agent who makes choices. He and to and to bear his image into this world, we we need to find that internal uh, spirit, that internal compass, and make right choices. That's what God does. He doesn't submit to a law that is above him and say, "What does the rule book say?" That's not how God lives. And and yet during the old covenant, because our hearts were hard, Jesus tells us in in Matthew nineteen, he says to the Pharisees, "Moses gave you these rules because your hearts were hard." Um, during the old covenant, because our hearts were hard, we needed those rules. So the way people made choices was to consult the rule book. What does the law of Moses say? And that's important when you are a young child, the Apostle Paul will say in Galatians 3 and 4. Galatians 3 and 4, the Apostle Paul says, we're like little kids, and little kids, especially strong-willed kids, they need a lot of rules, they need a lot of routine to keep them healthy. But God doesn't just want kids, he wants adult children who grow up and become his friends. Mm. We're still his children, but now we're like his friends. And, you know, when you grow up, you don't continue to call your mom and dad and ask them the rules. Now, it's, <laughs> now when you were three years old, it's really good that you didn't make all your own choices, right? You, you, And sometimes your parents didn't even bother to explain the reason why because you wouldn't understand it. But I'm not tired. It's 8 o'clock. You need to go to bed. But I'm not tired as you're slowly falling asleep. You, you don't. Not a, parents can't always have an argument with the kid. They just say, you need to go to bed. And when you're older, you'll realize. 
And a lot of the old covenant rules are like that. They're what we needed. They're the shape love took at the time. But eventually God wanted us to grow up. And it's not a success if you now grow up and you go off to university, seminary, college, and you, you're calling your mama you know, every night and saying, Mama, can I stay up till nine tonight? Because I got extra <laughs> sleep. I slept in this morning. And is it okay if she's not going to say, what a proud parent I am because I've taught my kid to always consult me with the rules. So the, the, the process of maturing, of maturation is, is the process of internalization. We take these external rules and we incorporate them, the principles of those rules. There's a principle behind every precept, behind every rule. And that is, you know, go to bed at eight o'clock becomes get enough rest in your life. You know, you have to eat all your vegetables becomes eat a healthy diet. Um, you can't you can't go outside until you put on your jacket becomes dress appropriately for the weather. But you take these principles from childhood, you internalize them. That's the new covenant okay. in our relationship with God. We actually we, we become self-actualized because we're no longer just someone obeying a rule book above us that hovers like laws we have to submit to. We internalize it and we make loving, wise choices because the Spirit of God himself is promised in the new covenant to come in, hang out with us, not yeah. override us, but to partner with us to be God's image bearers and make those wise choices. We really become ourselves. That's really part of the good news of the gospel. You will be self-actualized through this thing called the new covenant, which Jesus said is what his death was all about, by the way, which yeah. often gets underrepresented when we talk about atonement theories. We say, well, we forget what Jesus actually said. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. It's how he framed it for his disciples. We're starting a whole new way of being human and being in relationship with God, you know, right? starting with my death. So if the new covenant, and I struggle with this word, if I can nail it, we won't have to edit this part. <laughs> self actualiz I see I messed it up. Actualization. There it is. Yeah, yeah. Well <laughs> done. Cheers. Kudos. If, if Thank you. Uh, words are hard. Good thing I don't preach for a living. Um, but um, if that's the new covenant, then is kingdom work how we become other-centered? Yeah, good. Excellent. Yes. Yeah, so now that we become self-actualized and realize... I'm in the image of God, and I have his spirit to help me actually live that out. Uh, I can make loving choices rather than just submit to a rule book. Uh, now, what am I going to do with that? I'm okay. going to say, yay, I'm self-actualized. I've lived my maximum self. I'm, <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm fully the best version of me and just stop there. Now, all that's true, but then to say, well, then what am I going to do with that? Well, God's heart, with, I mean, God is love. He's fully self-actualized. He is all that he is to be. And what does he do with that love? He he creates and then he self-gives, right? He self-gives. And, you know, for God to love the world that he gave. So I say, so as a self-actualized person who's made to love, how can I now get out of myself and start loving other people, doing that kingdom work? Um, and, um, and that's what Maslow would call self-transcendence, to transcend the self, to get out of yourself, to go beyond yourself and to what you were called now to do out there in the world and connect with other people. And when we connect with other people, Jesus says, you're connecting with me. That's the parable of the sheep and the goats. Brilliant that you said that. I mean, that's the work of the Holy Spirit right there, because I was just going to, I was just going to say that. So that's then, our assembly so, fan. That's so, yeah. certain the Holy Ghost. Uh, all right. Holy Spirit. Spirit. No, but, uh, <laughs> What, what, what I was going to say is because then we realize all the commands of Jesus to care for the poor and the needy are no longer like it's not something you have to do or else it right, is right. rather it's an overflow of yes. of that spirit that lives in us. It's an overflow of, of God's work in us. That's it. That's it. So his his commands and his example are the external guidance system that reinforce what the spirit is saying inside us. Mm -hmm. Right, So we're not just left to say, well, now instead of following the law of Moses, I follow the law of Jesus and I have to follow him and do what he says. Rats, but OK. Instead, no, the spirit is inside us. Oh, and and both Jeremiah and Ezekiel, when talking about the new covenant, says we'll get a new heart and a new spirit and God's spirit. We get all the above. We get a new heart. We get a new spirit and we get God's spirit so that we're in partnership with the spirit of God really wanting. I mean, ultimately wanting to move in the direction of being our true selves, which is being Christ like. That's what Jesus shows us. He not only shows us what God is like, Jesus shows us for the first time in human history since Adam and Eve what a perfect human being looks like, yeah. what, a, what a perfect self-actualized and self-transcendent. Right? Jesus was fully himself and he was connected with the Father. And, and Jesus shows us what a perfectly actualized and perfectly transcendent human being looks like. And so when I look to Jesus, 
I'm not just blindly following a new rule book, a new covenant rule book. I'm, I'm seeing the external motivator of what I can now recognize what the voice of the Spirit is saying inside me. Uh, and I say, ah, ah, I recognize that. When I see Jesus, I, see, I hear that inside myself now. The Spirit's leading me in Christ's likeness, and I fully become even more of myself. Amen. Beautiful. Well, that just keeps getting brought up on this podcast, that, that Jesus is not only here to show us what God is like, but truly the prototype for humanity mm. is found in Jesus. So I'm so glad that you brought that up. I love that. And I love the fact that to be, to be fully human is to be Christ-like. And to be Christ-like is not to follow a set of rules, uh, but to truly live with other-centered, sacrificial, self-giving love. Yeah. Isn't that what Jesus showed us? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So beautiful. His his love ethic. Um, and, I, and I've only really recently just... Okay, I'll just say this. Sorry, I got a bunch of stuff going on in my brain. You're good. When I stare into the love ethic of Jesus and how he teaches us to live, sometimes I get... I don't know what the right word is. I got to find the right word. Maybe you guys can help me. Right now I'm calling it spiritual vertigo. And mm. by that I mean, do you know the experience? I don't know if you've ever done this. You go camping or you're just hanging out outside in the summer. You're lying on your back and you're staring at a starry, starry sky. And your mind just starts to explore. And you start to think about infinity and about the, the, the vastness of the universe. And sometimes I, as a kid, I used to think, what would happen if... The world turned upside down and gravity was no more. And I start falling upward, you know, into yeah. space. And how far would I go? And what is, and I just imagine the vastness of the sky. And I start tripping out. It's like getting high on cheap drugs as a five-year-old, you know? And I'm like, what? <laughs> and, and I don't know how to describe it. It's almost like a kind of, that was like psychological vertigo. When I get like spiritual vertigo and kind of like this dizzy, whoa, I think I'm getting high right now. When I just think about the brilliance of Jesus yeah. and how he leads us into this way of being human that you cannot find in any other philosophy or religion where he puts yeah. love at the center of everything. And he, he, he rescues people from the oppression of religion and its systematization of rules, regulations, rituals, and routines that we use, that we feel the pressure to use to get right with God. He delivers us from all of that and, and gives us this whole new way of being God's kids. And then he also, but he does, he also then gives us a, a, a new North Star to guide us, and that's love. And so he he has this, uh, first of all, he has the golden rule, treat other people the way you want to be treated, which teaches basic empathy. Make it, make your love decisions by empathizing with others. Put yourself in their shoes, mm -hmm. which is beautiful. Um, and m many religions have some version of the golden rule, but usually in the negative. It's usually do not do to others what you wouldn't want them to do to yourself. Uh, Jesus emphasizes the positive. But then before he dies, he actually gives them a love upgrade. He moves his followers from the golden rule to, uh, we could call it the platinum rule, <laughs> where he says, a new commandment I give you in John 13, right? Because when you say, well, a new command, well, uh, if it's about love, you've already given us like the best, right? It's the golden rule. It's the gold standard. And he goes, no, here's a new one. Here's a new one. Instead of telling them to love other people the way they would want to be loved, and which is basic human empathy, it's good. He says, now he says, I want you to love other people the way you have been loved by me. Yeah. Mm. Uh -huh. Okay. Next level. Next level. So I want you to keep your eyes on me. You know, and, and when you look at me, you are seeing what God is like. So I want you now to take how God has loved you through me and use that as your example now, how to love other people. And, well, that's, you can't get that anywhere else, this platinum love upgrade to say, okay, now all of, all of Christian ethics, if you're ever wondering what's the right thing to do, just stop and say, well, how has God treated me when I've been in this situation? When I've messed up, when I have been um, confused, when I've whatever the situation is between you and someone else, you don't just say, "How would I want to be treated in their situation? How have I been treated already by God?" Whenever I've been in that situation, wow, He was so gracious to me, so forgiving, He so embraced, He pursues, He, and then that becomes your ethic for moving forward. Yeah. And there's nothing like it. No, what hit me last week on that subject was God doesn't show, and this is obvious. But God doesn't show ultimate love until he leaves his throne and becomes flesh and enters into our situation with us, right? Mm -hmm. That's John 3, 16. Mm -hmm. So we can't love like God until we enter people's situations. I can't yeah. love you from afar. I can't love you and say, oh, 
James said it when he's talking about faith without works is dead. I can't say, see my brother's hungry. Oh, have a nice day. Be well. I have to put myself, I have to enter into his story in order to love him rightly. Oh, so good. So good. And the beauty of it all is when we enter other people's story to love rightly, we're not only loving the way God has loved us, but we're actually connecting. We're closing the loop and we're connecting with God more than we yes. realize. The new, the new Testament emphasis for our spiritual worship is actually not vertical. It's not that vertical worship is is um, is wrong. It's there. It's just never the New Testament emphasis. Yeah. Uh, vertical worship is mentioned um, with the tip of the hat, but even in a context like Ephesians 5, be filled with the Spirit, singing to one another with psalms, hymns, spiritual songs. Even then, wow. the thing we would call corporate worship in a church where we get together and sing, he says, well, you're actually singing for each other's benefit, to reinforce to one another what you believe the truth to be. And he says, and making melody to God in your heart. What's happening in your heart is for God. What's coming out of your mouth and the piano music, the band, the organ, whatever it may be, and the singing, that's for each other. Sing mm -hmm. to one another. And so this mindfulness of others around us is always a New Testament emphasis. In Galatians 5.14, I think, Galatians 5.14, the Apostle, Paul, the Apostle Paul does something that we might miss it, is, is indicative of all New Testament teaching. He says the entire law is summed up in one command. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. Yeah. Mm. Now this is interesting because he's actually shifted something from what Jesus said. Yes. Right? Jesus was asked, what's the greatest command? And he said, love God with all that you've got, and then love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law is summed up in these two commands. But now, after Jesus says that, there is no record of New Testament church leaders ever repeating that. Wow. When they're writing to Christians who already say, well, I love God, they never repeat the love God command. They always now take that second command and say that sums it up. Just love your neighbor as yourself. Focus on that. And you will be loving God. Mm. And, and, and that, that picks up on you know, Jesus' parable of the sheep and the goats who— Mm. They're, they're not being saved by their works. They're being saved by Jesus. They just didn't realize, even the sheep didn't realize that when they were loving other people, they were connecting with Jesus. They were loving Jesus. They were worshiping and honoring Jesus. Um, and that theme of love others as your way to love God, uh, love others as your way to worship God, is repeated by um, not only Paul a couple of times, but the Apostle James, the Apostle Peter, um, the Apostle John in 1 John. And and we might miss it, that this is a very intentional new approach to even what worship means for the new covenant people of God. It's very earthy. It's very, it's embracing of other people if we really want to get close to God. Well, John and First John points that out when he says, if you say you love God, but hate your brother, you're a liar. So the yeah. emphasis there again is on loving the people around us. Yeah, yes. John, 1 John is full of that kind of thinking. 1 John 3.16, the other John 3.16, 1 John 3.16 is beautiful. He says, this is how we should know it. This is how we know what love is. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid his life down for us, and now you, you would expect him to complete that sentence. This is how we know what love is. Jesus has laid his life down for us, so you ought to lay your life down for him. Mm -hmm. You would think that's what it says, right? We often say that in, in youth group, right? We say, uh, Jesus died for you. The least you can do is live for him. Right? <laughs> Jesus laid his life down for you. You lay your life down for him. You and, and we make it transactional between us and God, completely vertical. It's not how the New Testament church taught at all. We don't have an example of that. We don't have an example of that. Uh, Jesus sets that up. But then for those who make that maneuver and say, okay, I'm giving my life to God, after that, now the worship emphasis for the rest of the New Testament is Jesus laid his life down for us. Therefore, we ought to lay our life down for others. We ask, how has God loved me? Now that's how I'm going to go and love the people around me. Gosh, I love that so much. And oh, just like one little note I had in there that when we're talking about the horizontal worship and vertical worship. Yeah. In my experience within church life, it's like as a church body, when you focus more on the loving others, the horizontal worship, you could say, the vertical worship is increased. The yes. Whenever you focus more on outwardly, when you focus more on giving, when you focus more on uh, you know, going to the food kitchen sure. or going to visit prisoners or going to the hospital or whenever those things happen, uh, you just can't help but it, there's a more, you could say, a more intense praise, a more, you know, vulnerable praise vertically yeah. to God uh, when it does come to church life and the church service. And so 
Um, and that's that's not a mistake. That 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 feedback loop is created by God. I mean, that's what we were made for. And um, it just it's just cool to see how God does that in His work. Amen. Amen. What an amazing. If Christians were really following Christ, if we were really the Jesus-y people we we're called to be, then then even non-Christians would be happy to see our faith grow. Yeah. Um, we've had people at the Meeting House who, over the years, uh, I'll give you one example. An uh, atheist guy, he was, I mean, he's, he's classic. He's a trans, transgender atheist Wiccan, uh, high priest uh, Wiccan. So he... I, he was like everything that you would think wouldn't fit in a church. Okay, that's that's why I'm pointing out the details. Transgender atheist Wiccan comes to the meeting house for a few services, and he said, uh, "Bruxy, I got to know him well. We went out, we chatted, and I answered a lot of his questions." He finally said, "I don't know if following Jesus is for me. Um, I'm I might be back, I might not." And in the end, he came back a few times. He's been hit, hit and miss, but he says, "Here, I want to start giving to the church." So what? That's usually people who say they love Jesus. It's hard to get them to give to the church. <laughs> you say you don't even know if you want to commit, but you want to start giving. He goes, yeah. He says, here's why. He says, if 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 you're helping more Christians actually live like Jesus, I think that's good for the planet. I think that's good for this world. And I know that Christianity is like going to be a dominantly influential religion within this country, within Western society. So I I instead of just trying to get rid of Christianity, because I know that'll never happen as a militant atheist. I actually just want to want to help Christianity become more like Christ. And if if I can, that's not my personal calling, but I'm going to give you money if that's what you're doing. And I, thought, I mean, when people vote with their money, there that's a real vulnerable investment of trust. Yep. And um, and so it seems to me that what both Christians and non Christians could agree on is that the world will benefit when Christians start acting like Christ. Amen. Yeah. No doubt so, about so, so much of our so much of our so many of our issues would be fixed, you know. Yeah. Yes. I mean, I mean that that like if everybody started to live by kingdom principles by the teachings that Jesus taught, like we wouldn't have you know the word like all these things we bicker about in the news and all. I mean, it would just it would go away. It would go away. I don't. It's just interesting to think about. Yeah. Oh, it is. It is. And one day that'll be a total reality. And in the meantime, I know that people will say, "Well, then it's not practical," because in the meantime. There's still going to be bad people and you still got to have your firearms and you still got to make sure that you are outraged and you're militant and you're and you're fighting for. And I'd say, well, in the meantime, it's true. There's a disparity. But I want to be on the well, to use that phrase, I want to be on the right side of history. I want to be a product of my future, not a product of my past. I don't want to use my outrage and my hurt and anxiety from the past to define who I am. But rather, mm -hmm. as a Christian, we are products of our future. Where are we headed? What is the kingdom going to be like? And therefore, how can we click, drag, and drop our future into our present and say, if that's where we're headed, I, I, I want to live an, an eternity of love. So I'm going to start living love now. I want to live an eternity of peace. I'm going to start living the peaceful life now. And that's true. If I if um, I don't defend myself well or if I die in the process or something, that's fine because I'm, I'm leaning into my future. It's where I'm going. And the world desperately needs examples of what the kingdom of Jesus looks like here and now. And um, if if not us, then then there's nobody. So that's not waiting to die to uh, to enter eternal life. That is living out the kingdom right now. That we are Jesus followers in His kingdom right now. Right now, this and then when we die, that's a small transition. But mm -hmm. we actually already started our eternal life. Yeah. We've entered into our eternal life now. Um, what more vivid imagery could Jesus use than in John three, where He says it's like being born all over again? You're you're starting your new life now. Rebirth would have been an interesting and helpful image to use to talk about the transition of death. If Jesus wanted to do that, he could have said, when you die, it's like being born again and you become a new person when you die. And it would be all a beautiful image of hope in the future. But he he talks about being born again now. And we realize that's how his apostles inter interpreted it. Peter, when he's writing first Peter, says he's writing to the church of those who are born again, who are born again, not will be born into a new life when you die. Um, so that changes the game. That's, I mean, death is a transition, but I already started my life after death, my eternal life now. I died right. to my old self. I'm born into that new life now. I'm going to start living like it. Mm. Right on. Can you, uh, we're running out of time. Can you give us the gospel in 30 words? Yeah, sure. Happy to, man. Um, and again, this is not something just to be parroted. It's, it's actually 
And I'll leave it for people to you know read the book Reunion and, and unpack it more. But um, each one of these aspects of the gospel in 30 words is one of those dimensions of the gospel that I think captures. It's an entire discussion on its own. But I just use it and I memorize it for myself to help organize my thinking. So gospel in one word is Jesus. The gospel in three words, Jesus is Lord. The gospel in 30 words. Jesus is God with us. Come to show us God's love, save us from sin, set up God's kingdom, and shut down religion so we can share in God's life. I'll say it again. Jesus is God with us. Come to show us God's love, save us from sin, set up God's kingdom, and shut down religion so we can share in God's life. Mm. And every every phrase, every aspect of that is just a beautiful precious pearl worth unpacking over time, but it creates multiple entrance points. The love of God, salvation from the shame and guilt of sin, uh, the kingdom a purpose that I, I, my purpose every day I wake up is to experience and extend the kingdom of Christ. I, I have a reason for being in this world, the kingdom message, the end of religion. Uh, and, and I know Christians will use different words. I wouldn't get hung up on that. You know, Brian Zond will say, I'm a very religious person and he and I are friends and we believe we're preaching the same message. We use our words differently. Um, and, but the, the new covenant message, however you frame that, I call that the end of religion, you can call it the end of the old, the birth of the new, uh, the end of the systematization of faith, the uh, the end of the way of law in favor of the way of love. Um, but something about the gospel frees us up from that law-based living into the self-actualization we've been talking about. So all of these different ways of um, entering the conversation depends on who you're talking about. You can talk to someone who says, well, I'm open to God. Jesus is cool. I just hate religion. And I'm happy to say, great. Let's have, I think you'll get along just fine with Jesus. Let's talk more about this message. Yeah. 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 Right. I love it. Broxy, this has been an amazing conversation. And I just appreciate you and um, how central Jesus is to everything that you teach. Um, you know, as it should be as an Anabaptist, you know, that's that's what you preach and teach. But, you know, as, um, you know, me coming from a Pentecostal church and Jonathan uh, pastoring a Christian church. I'm like a mutt. This is very, it, it's just very <laughs> important to us, you know, that we can, you, you mentioned earlier with the internet, people can find a theological home in places other than their own denomination. Mm. Um, that's what this podcast has become for us. And so we're just thankful to have uh, you on today to be able to speak uh, into our lives, but then also into the lives of those listening right now. And so thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you, my brothers. And I'll just say this. I don't know if this is helpful for you or for any of your listeners, but it was only a year or two ago that we we were bumping into enough like-minded Christians like this, but from all different backgrounds. We said, can we can, could we put together an organization where we could all find a, a shared space online to learn from one another and build friendships. Mm. Um, and so we call it Jesus Collective. And if anyone is interested in that, if anyone's feeling like, oh, I love my church, my denomination, but I, I want to also hang out with more Jesus-y, like-minded Christians, if they go to jesuscollective.com, uh, you can put your email address in there and get on, a, on an updating email list. And we're developing an online platform just for pastors and Christians to find each other and just build relationship. So that's jesuscollective.com or Jesus Collective on social media. Perfect. Awesome. We'll put that in the links. What, what else do you want to tell us? Uh, we encourage folks to buy uh, Reunion. I can Thanks. check that book out. Do you have any other projects going on or how else can people connect to you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, depending on when this airs, the at the end of religion is my first book. I've just kind of rewritten and added five more chapters to it, and that uh, extended edition, it, the project got way out of control. <laughs> but that, the extended edition of the end of religion is released this fall, probably around November. But you can pre-order it now on Amazon. So whenever anyone's listening to this, you can go to Amazon.com.ca wherever you are, and um, if you type in my name, Bruxy Cavey. I mean, with a name like Bruxy Cavey, I'm easy to find on social media or, you know, on Amazon, whatever. And um, and you can find Reunion there, but also uh, The End of Religion or wherever you buy books. And um, and that's where I really dive into this kind of new covenant transition, as well as in the book Reunion. Yeah. Right on. Perfect. Perfect. I love it. So we're going to edit this part out because we didn't warn you. Um, our podcast is called Prayerfully Woke. Yes. And we, we like to ask our guest at the end of the podcast for a last question. What does prayerfully woke mean to you? <laughs> I was going to say, I have no idea what your podcast means, but I am I like you guys. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, I mean, I don't know about your podcast name, but I like you guys. So, yeah, I have no, I have no idea. So I was like, There's, they're going to tell me, right? <laughs> <laughs> we, like to, we like to think of it as uh, 
being socially aware, but bringing Jesus into that awareness, not just uh, you know, not just being guilty of uh, the clickbait kind of thing, but also being prayerful about society. And, and instead of focusing on the problem, maybe more focusing on the solution through Jesus. It's good. It's good. Does that make any sense? I love the I love the meaning of your podcast name. <laughs> well, well, we, William Paul Young hates he chastised it. us. He for... chastised us. He thought we were very narcissistic for naming it that. But <laughs> oh, really? No. Yes. I... I'm just neutral. I just figure, like, you know, like I'm the guy who doesn't get the joke. I think everybody knows knows something that I don't know, but that's okay. I like you guys. I trust your hearts. That's good. Well, and then hearing you explain it, I think that's lovely. I still don't. You're right. I, I probably the name is right over my head, but what you just good, said brother. was lovely. Right on. Well, we're so we're so thankful uh, that you agreed to join us today. And uh, we're thankful for your heart. I'll, I'll echo Walker's sentiments that we're, it's, it's so refreshing to hear a Jesus-centered gospel. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I'm just thankful for your, your life and your ministry and uh, thankful to make a new friend today. So thank you. Thank you, guys. I feel the same way. You've got a good thing going on. I wish you all the best with it, both of you, John and Walker. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much. God bless, brother. Bless you.